All right. Okay, so I've gone ahead and launched the webinar and it looks like people are starting to join. <clears throat> Is it sunny where you are, Susan? It has been sunny all day, yeah. It looks like it's just clouding over now, but no, it, uh, you cannot complain about hanging your Christmas lights in your shorts. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I had to pull the, the blind down. I got a little bit too much glare going on because the sun's just, just now streaming into this window. Mm. Yeah. Nice yeah, the view. same thing. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it looks like uh, the numbers are still climbing, but uh, it looks like the majority of the people have uh, have joined us. And it looks to me, I will share our first poll. It looks like the majority of our attendees are from Ontario. And but we are coast to coast again. We've got uh, from British Columbia all the way through to the Atlantic provinces. So thank you so much for answering that question. We want to have one other question just so we know um, who all is on the, uh, the webinar today. So what is your occupation? So as people continue to join, let's see. Oh, it looks like we've got a wide range uh, represented in every category. I'll show you those results in just a moment. All right, so let's just take a look at that. So our number one category is builders and renovators. So that's good. To see. And we've got um, all categories represented here from trades through to academia and uh, others. So uh, thank you so much for uh, providing those uh, answer. So welcome to the second of the From Bleeding Edge to Leading Edge uh, webinar by Doug Terry. Uh, my name is Stephanie Coleman. I'm with, with Building Knowledge. Uh, what, and I want to thank um, uh, Enbridge for their sponsorship and uh, they'll be able to speak in just a minute. But before I do that, I hand that off to uh, Susan from Enbridge. I would like to just do a little bit of housekeeping. So uh, just can you, oh, it looks like the numbers keep climbing. That's fantastic. Um, so if you can hear me, just raise your hand uh, just to get familiar with the uh, with the settings there. Lots of hands going up. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, you can put your hands down. Uh, I think we've got pros on the on the call. I think they've uh, they know what's coming up. So the Q and A is for any questions you have for uh, for Doug or for Will, who's going to be joining us in a little bit. Uh, so use that for any questions you have uh, for the chat. Use that for any say technical issues or any sort of general statements that you would like to make. Um, so that's my quick housekeeping. If we run into any technical issues, I will be in touch with you by email. This is being recorded. Um, so if it does go long, because there are so many questions and lot, lots to cover last time, uh, it is being recorded and you'll be receiving the resources in an email. Um, but again, like I said earlier, thank you so much to Enbridge and to Susan for your support and your sponsorship in making this happen. And I wanted to hand this off to Susan. Oh, thanks, Steph. Um, so yes, hi everybody on behalf of Enbridge Gas. Um, just wanna welcome everyone participating in today's second session. Uh, we've got some great content today as always from one of our builders who you know, is, is so willing to share experiences and learnings and their own mistakes to make our entry and your entry into the world of net zero just that much simpler process. So as we did from session one, I'm confident that we're all gonna take away some great new ways of thinking. But I also wanted to take the opportunity today to send a special thanks to Doug for his recent participation in the Ontario HBA Awards of Distinction and our Enbridge Red Carpet pre-show. Doug starred in the role of Cindy Brady in our OHBA Brady Bunch skit, and that was above and beyond the call of duty and shows just what a great sport he really is. So if you were not lucky enough to see this show and want to catch Doug and the crew of our other Ontario builders with a sense of humor, you can still see it posted on ohba.aod.ca website. If you miss the awards, it's no problem. Just register and uh, you can access everything about the show and the awards. 
So with that, I will say from Enbridge, please stay safe, stay well, stay kind, and most importantly right now, please stay vigilant because the fight is not over yet, but we are all in it together. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Cindy, uh, I mean, to Doug and Stephanie. So thanks, enjoy the time. Thank you, Susan. Now, Doug, I'm going to... <laughs> Susan and I may have been in cahoots on that one. Uh, Doug, I'm gonna get you to share your screen, please. <laughs> okay, I got a poll question in the way here. So share the screen and we're looking yeah. at the... Uh... <laughs> and thank you so much, Susan, for your support and for your kind words. Thank you so okay. much. Um, okay, so now I'm going to officially introduce Doug. Uh, so Doug is the Vice President for Doug Terry Homes. He is the past president for the Ontario Home Builders Association. He has served uh, for many years as the OHBA Technical Chair and continues in that role. Uh, he also serves on the CHBA Net Zero as well as the Technical Research Councils at, at the national level. And I was very pleased to be able to present to him the 2019 CHBA Member of the Year a few months back. And uh, recently he received the 2019 InterQuality Hall of Fame. So Doug Terry, it's up, it's uh it's all yours now. So Steph, are you ready for round two? I'm ready for round two. Okay, just like NASCAR, we're gonna put our foot on the gas and get going. Okay. So first of all, I always like to do a, a, a thank you to our sponsors, uh, without whom we can't do this type of programming. Uh, you just heard from Susan, a huge thank you for them for taking a risk on us uh, when the book's not even finished. So that's a great sign of faith. Uh, to Steph for, for facilitating and building knowledge for making her available and all the support they've given. And then also seed funding to Natural Resources Canada because this was actually uh, their idea for the book and then to do, well, it was originally supposed to be a PowerPoint but I guess they're getting a little bit more than they bargained for there. So without further ado, well, let's get after it. Uh, as we know, this is the same as the last time. We are one of the first builders to really get into volume uh, net zero ready homes and uh, have been blessed with a couple of accolades over the years. Uh, best reason ever is uh, grandbaby Corbin here. We want to make sure that we got a planet for our grandkids and, our, and all of our children's children. And so this is really a huge uh, motivation for me as to why I, I'm wanting to get after this with everybody. All right, so the agenda and objectives for today, we're going to review houses as a system part one. Uh, we're gonna talk about house design. We're gonna talk about energy modeling. Uh, we're gonna talk about choosing the optimal wall and then solar ready. And we're gonna have Will Beardmore join us for the solar piece, which is gonna be solar ready, solar complete. Uh, you guys are probably gonna find that really cool. So I'm looking forward to that part of it. And I you know, really enjoy working with Will. So this is a great opportunity for us to collaborate a little bit more. Okay, so house is a system. I recommend uh, what's called a holistic approach to planning. And your first planning meeting should really provide the energy performance targets you intend to achieve. This is when your team should tear your plans apart, right? Uh, look at all the components that need to be changed, how they fit together. You know, so many of these components, they interact with each other. So it's not just a case of, of picking in isolation. And that's, that's one thing that I found over the years is that as we were doing something, we might solve one problem by picking one component and then find that there would be a reaction on three other things. So you solve one problem and it makes three more and then you're, you're trying to figure that out. So what I'm advocating is to feel my pain and say, I don't want that and look at it more holistically. So looking at how things interact together is really, really important. For example, if you've got multiple bump outs or cantilevers on a wall or the exterior wall adds cost uh, that it's adding cost to, it's also adding complexity to the air sealing, the water management and getting the insulation right. So that's additional detailing that has to be explained and managed with your framer, your insulator, your siding contractor, all in order to be successful. When we're taking a holistic approach to design, we have to consider everything from that initial design all the way through construction sequencing, right onto the effects of the schedule and down on into your, your customer care at the end, right? So, if expectations for your designer have not been clearly laid out at the beginning, your construction team is gonna have a fight on their hands with constant roadblocks that they have to try to get through, right? So it's important that we understand the holistic approach. So Steph, let's review the critical steps of the design process as I see them. 
first of all, is the house design review. And now this is what's in the book, by the way, and we're not getting through all of this because the, the format just doesn't permit it. But house design review, water management. Well, water management was so important that we actually did that in the first session. Energy modeling. So looking at your air tightness target. In our case, it's one air change per hour, but for net zero's purposes, it's under one and a half air changes per hour. A uh, survey of your roof. This is an area that a lot of builders have not really gotten to yet. It is a little bit time consuming, but high, high value. Choosing the optimal wall assembly, looking at basement walls, radon and sub slab insulation, and what that means for, for both safety and comfort, uh, window selections, HVAC sizing and design, ventilation and humidity control, and water conservation. Now, a good chunk of these are gonna come up on next week's session because it's too much to cover today. So don't panic, we're not trying to do all this today. Okay, what's our desired outcome? So Steph, do you know what the number one thing that is that happens on a job site? Well, I've seen um, it's some Tim Hortons drinking coffee i've seen uh all sorts of different things yeah and yeah you're on, you're on the right track. absolutely nothing that's what happens number one thing on the job site is absolutely nothing so how do we work on that well there's a lot to be gained by looking at reducing the amount of nothing that, that's happening on the job site and we're going to do a real good drill down on that in the fourth session as well but it needs to be considered with a critical look. And one of the things that I see as a problem with absolutely nothing happening is when the trades or the foreman don't have the information they need because they're tackling something that's complicated. And while they're sitting there waiting, the clock's ticking and the money's being spent. So uh, we need to be able to figure out how to get them the answers so it doesn't kill time on the job site. And part of that is this holistic design approach. So what do we wanna do? Well, we wanna have a whole team approach to avoid costly errors. We want to reduce the time in the field with nothing happening. And we want to create project takeoffs for our trades and suppliers so that they have the answers up front. I know that sounds easy to do, and I know a lot of us are addressing that, but it gets more critically important as we try new things that are more complex and outside of their, their comfort zone. So the house design review. All right, the case for smaller. Do we need to build McMansions? That's a question. Uh, we wanna look at addressing affordable housing. We wanna reduce our carbon footprint. We wanna increase community density. We wanna create walkable communities. And it's not just in towns and mid-rise, it's also in a couple of design movements that are, that are becoming highly popular. One's getting a lot of, uh, lot of exposure right now, and it's the tiny homes. But there's a backgrounder one as well that's been around for about 22 years, and that's the not so big house. And I'm a proponent of that type of design. So the concept is, is that you want to design for function as opposed to volume. We don't need a huge house if we can make everything work within a smaller space. So uh, I've just been in a house like this over the last little bit. My daughter's actually looking at buying a version of this specific home. And uh, here's the thing is, you know, many times I've heard they don't build them like they used to, as if that's a bad thing. You know, they don't build them like they used to. The old guy and he's coming into our model, they don't build them like they used to. I heard them say many times. Well, this is a bungalow back in the 1970s. And I get they're not built like they used to be. You know, back in the day, that's a 412 pitch on a gable-ended roof. And, you know, you've got the same, same stick frame going all the way across. In fact, if you were to make that into trusses now, you could probably just crane the whole thing on in one piece, right? But, you know, my dad built hundreds of these from the 60s to the 80s. And right now I'm tearing one apart. It's from about 1981. And it's got a cantilever over top of the, of the, the, the kitchen is, is kicked out. And it is so full of mold. It just makes you ill, man. And you have to wear masks when you're in there. And so this is a, a, a rental property that we're getting prepared for sale. And what used to happen is the, the builder would create this little bit of additional space, but there wouldn't be good detailing for air management, moisture management, uh, insulation detailing, that sort of thing. And you know what they do, Steph? They'd say, hey, listen, you're freezing your pipes up, so run the water a little bit in the wintertime. Just leave it on a drip, right? That kitchen sink push out, it causes a lot of problems with things like frozen pipes and mold, right? And oftentimes you didn't have the right amount of insulation up over top of the... Uh, of the cantilever. 
But you know what? This detail with the right orientation, this roof line, it's pretty darn good for solar. And the homes were generally pretty well built. They had good bones because they were simple and builders understood what it was they were doing. Today, we have better windows, air barriers, insulation, shingles, and a whole host of new products that didn't exist 40 years ago. They didn't have to worry about that because they weren't there. So over all the details and materials are, are just simply better, but I think we can still benefit from looking at history. So this right here is, uh, is the Waterford Cottage. You know this house pretty well because it's just, uh, just down the street from where you used to be in, in one subdivision over from where you are now, right? And uh, it's right on Lake Margaret, by the way. So let's not ignore the history lessons. So in some ways there's some really valid reasons for why simplicity of design is good. For starters, when these guys were doing these designs, they didn't have computers, right? I remember who, my dad, he was a mining engineer and he would sit at the kitchen table and he'd have the blueprint and he'd have this little trace stencil, right? For, you know, okay, I'm gonna put a toilet here and I'm gonna change my door swing here. And he would trace it on the plan, right? Uh, it was really cool to watch. And I, as a kid, I loved playing with that. That was the neatest thing, right? And that's probably where my interest in design started. But you know what, there was also far less specialization in the field at the time. You didn't have, um, you know, five designers on staff and you didn't have your decor team and what have you. It was, you know, there was, you picked the brick and you picked the shingle and you, everything was white and off you went, right? And if you were lucky, you got the one paint color in the, in the rooms and maybe you had that 10 test as your, as your insulation on the outside. So even back then, some builders were looking at continuous insulation with things like the 10 test, but they didn't have 50 new homes or 10 new homes a year. They didn't have 15 in their SKU and all that information to, to maintain. So it was a much simpler time. My point being is just because it can be designed in the computer does not mean it should ever hit the job site, right? We have to really think uh, of, of what we're doing and the ability to produce it in an effective manner, right? That doesn't mean we uh, begin to consider issues such as skilled trades being omitted. We have to look at that as well. Do we have the people that can actually produce the product there as well? So that's an important consideration. It's not just about can we design it, but can we actually produce it? That doesn't mean we should go back to the rectangular four by 12 gable-ended house uh, or that we should design our homes without beauty and function in mind. I think far from it. In fact, beauty is an integral part of making people feel good about their, their living space. And it, it really should be considered. But in general terms, when you're considering your design concepts, I'd like to suggest it, can you answer one simple question with each design consideration? Am I making the homeowner's life easier or harder? If the answer is harder, then you should reconsider your design. A very quick thought on this is, a lot of builders still put the little lazy Susan corner into the corner. You know, that's the spot where stuff goes to get lost and die. Uh, especially if you use it for, you know, your, your Tupperware lids, that's the worst, man, because they fall off and behind. You can never find that stuff, right? Well, a very cost-effective transition would be put in a pantry, right? It's the same amount of space. You're losing a little bit of counter space. It's roughly the same amount of price, but it's a huge impact on the ability to store, right? And when you start looking at smaller homes where you don't have as much space for storage or wasted space, things like that become critically important. So my, my point being is these homes cannot start and end with energy efficiency, although we're talking about net zero. Uh, in order to get the size down, which helps with their overall carbon footprint, they have to be functional, they have to be easy to maintain, they've gotta be pleasant to live in, and they have to be emotionally appealing. So it's important that we add design elements that will help you sell the home. Just don't let the designer or the architect design for the sake of showing off, right? Does that make sense? So is the design beneficial is where I'm leaving this one. Now I just got to get my mouse to cooperate and here we go. So I'm going to do a little tear apart of this uh, Waterford Cottage house. This home was built on the edge of a lake and at a park. So the the side here is all exposed to public view. It's got a, a, a road beside it. So it's, you know, hundreds of cars per day that see this. Um, this home also won every award in Canada back in the 2005, so OHBA, CHBA, and local. Now, when we look at the front, it's got, I would say, excellent curb appeal. It has a large porch that's protecting the occupants when they're coming into the home if their elements are bad. It's got a nice seating area on the porch for them to want to be able to hang out. 
That's not necessarily important in every community, but in this particular home with it backing on to the side of a park, it was important, right? Uh, but if you look as well, another element is water management. And we designed it so that the roof line allowed water to come off of that front gable and across the garage. Oh, back it up, sorry. Across the garage so you didn't have water spilling down onto the walkway or the garage uh, driveway, right? Now the side was on the park. And so on the side, what we did because of the visibility is we wanted to have something that had high impact and but we wanted to maintain roof lines. So it looks like there's a complicated bump out here stuff with these two gables on this on that side. That's all veneer, right? So when you actually look at the roof framing, it's continuous framing. The wall framing is continuous framing. It was just literally done by veneers, but the, it's really striking when you see the difference between. And that's a way that we can, you know, reduce cost and reduce uh, complications there. Now, with that, with that being done and having the extension up into the roof line. We did limit solar panels in that area or the potential for them. However, on this specific home, there was south end rear available. So we were in good shape for that. And we're gonna get into that with Will later on today, okay? I wonder if I can just do it from here. Oh, much easier. Then when we go to the inside, the not so big house concept, when you design smaller, it becomes critically important, as I said, to think of the space, but also of the flow within that space. You know, in the years I've designed, I found it's really easy to design for a big space. But when you're looking at small and functional, uh, it's, it's, it's a more of a challenge. You've got to really think your way through it because you don't have any place to waste, right? And this home actually came in at 1,498 square feet. Um, <clears throat> oftentimes when I'm out looking at other builders' product, I, I often wonder, was the designer just not given clear instructions? Did they not understand the space that they were trying to design or, or maybe that they just don't get the opportunity to go to the job site and look at what they're designing? Because I think if they did more site walks and I, and I highly encourage our designers to do that, if they do more site walks, they'll understand better the flow of space, especially if they got somebody senior that can walk them through. When you do this, this becomes a problem. For example, having stairs that open right up onto a, uh, sorry, a door opening right up into the stairs and there's no place to step into, right? Here's another example though. It's quite common to see bedrooms that are larger than they need to be with hallways and doors that are code minimums. And now, Steph, I, I know that we've talked in the past about Frank, Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright, right? And he's mm. got that house in Buffalo. And when you walk into that home, it's the Prairie House, right? You walk into that home and it forces you in the foyer to have really low ceilings. I think it's only just over seven feet and you feel claustrophobic. And then as you step through, it opens up, right? And it gives this feeling of grandiosity, right? But that first bit, you're really uncomfortable as you first walk in. And so what I'm suggesting is when we look at hallway space, yes, you're going to have the major bedroom size if you have bigger size. The challenge is, is that you're actually forcing people as they're going to bed into a smaller confined space. Yes, it then does open up, but it feels claustrophobic going in. And that's not really what we want to have as we're going into bedroom space. So when we look at, say, the second and third bedrooms, they don't need space for a king size bed and two end tables. That's not really what the function is there for. So my feeling is, is grab a little bit of space from those rooms and make sure that the hallways and the doors are wider and more functional. This is also going to help with, you know, getting furniture in and out, that sort of thing. If, if you have to modify the home to accessibility, it's a lot further along the way. So that's something that I, I really advocate strongly for. And codes are starting to go in that direction to, to look at having that. So I, I usually say like maybe a minimum of a 30 inch door uh, as an absolute minimum. I prefer 32s to 36s. Um, the other thing is, is often, oftentimes I see that designers haven't really thought through storage and, and how the occupant is going to, to manage the home effectively. And again, you can see on the plan here, this has got a walk-in pantry just off of, uh, just off of the, the kitchen here. That's really, really handy. And it's massively increasing the, the area of storage. The clients love it and it's really cost-effective to do. Okay, so the next thing is when we're looking at the interior is that you can see that there's the, the roof line it's going to be continuous as you go out over this covered deck area. And so by doing that, when you're going across the, the front bedroom, the kitchen, the dining area, and the covered area, 
it would typically create a longer, simpler roof line that's going to be better for, you know, putting solar on. Uh, it's also better for keeping the roof framing and, and the sheathing and what have you less complicated. And that's important because it's going to have reduction of valleys that are, that are going to be expensive to do. It's also, though, adding an outdoor space that's kind of nice for three season living, right? The downside on this particular plan is the great room had a bump out on it. So that does complicate the roof line. And it also adds four corners. And as we know, you know, each corner has got an additional cost. So this home could have been identical square footage by simply reducing the great room a slight bit and upping the master bedroom. And it would probably have been a lot less cost to do. Uh, this home typically is quite a bit more expensive than, than some of our other homes in this size range because it does have a couple of features like that. The covered deck obviously adds cost, so can you sell that value proposition? It does have a more complicated stair system than a straight run stairs and things like that. Uh, so it comes down to, is this part of your portfolio? Are there clients that are willing to buy it because it makes sense? And if need be, can you take it through a charrette and simplify it to make it less costly? And this home's back from 15 years ago now. Wow, 15 years, that's a long time. Uh, another point to mention, though, is your, your bathrooms. Uh, in this particular case, the bathrooms are designed to stack. So you're going to have a common wet wall. And the nice part about that common wet wall, it means that we're going to be able to have the, the principal stacks being able to drop down um, for the two showers, roughly the same spot. So you're starting to share plumbing. And there actually ends up with this home only being one major stack, uh, just uh, right where the laundry is, but in the basement. And that, uh, if you've got to end up doing the drain water heat recovery, if that's part of what you're doing, it makes it a lot simpler. Simpler, you're only having to put one in, and uh, the, the plumbing to it, it's already pre-designed. So, fairly cost-effective way of doing this. Now, could we do better on it? Well, we're learning all the time, so yes, we certainly can address it. But that was an early attempt at having a common wet wall. Uh, I've already said. Uh, some of some of these, but the house design action plan is really meant for folks as a review or a little bit of a guide. I say ditch the lazy Susan add the walk in pantry. They're both the same size. We already covered this bit, but the same thing goes for linen closets. Oftentimes I see they're, you know, two foot deep and, and two foot wide and like that's just another place where things go to die, right? You can't get back in. So if we actually look at like a large set of towels, they're going to be approximately 14 inch square for a beach towel or 17 by 12 for a luxury towel, depending on how you fold it. So we, we only really need about two inches more than that. And that gets you to a, typically around uh, about 16 inches to 18 inches deep. So we actually designed for 18 inches depth as, as our maximum. And uh, by the time we do that with an 18 inch deep uh, closet, we can accommodate pretty much everything. Uh, make the bedroom hallways at least 46 to 48 inches wide and then you know, at minimum do a 30 inch door, if not, you know, preferably getting into 32s and 36s, right? Uh, Pre-design your mechanical room, even if you're not finished in the basement. And if you can condense the size, don't let the HVAC contractor control where it's gonna go because you're gonna end up with it right in the middle of the family room that's not there yet, right? And that's gonna get the phone call from you in a couple of years and there's people are gonna be pretty upset with you. Uh, it also gives you the opportunity to help finish uh, selling finished basement space. And if you are also dealing with the mechanical layouts at the time, it's pre-done. It not only makes it easier for the client to figure it out, but let's say that on closing that the, the deal is, is you've got to add a finished basement space. You already know what you're doing because it's pre-designed for that. Now we're going to get into more of that in, in uh, the next session. Uh, the next one is dump the cold cellar. Okay. It is a mold factory that you're attaching to your house and it's nothing but problems. Everyone that we've done in the last probably six, seven years has led to grief. And we've done about one a year, whereas in the past we used to do quite a few. And in part of that is it's just not really functional, right? From, a, from an energy and water and moisture management and airflow standpoint. Um, the problem is, is nobody knows how to use it. Nobody has an understanding of what's going to happen in there. And they start doing stuff like putting things that cause mold in there. And even if you get just dust stuff, because you're going to have those vents on the side, it's going to get on the walls and then it's going to get wet and then it's you've got a mold factory because what's mold need it needs a food source it needs moisture moisture yeah. and it needs temperature right and it's a perfect breeding ground for mold and you know to avoid that you've got to clean it almost weekly 
it, they just don't work, right? If you want to, if you want a cold seller, I'd say condition it. Now try doing the math on the required insulation uh, on that, and you know you've got your seven foot ten. You're you're going to be lucky if you get about six foot six left in in that room by the time it's all all is said and done. Sorry, you don't have seven foot ten. It's it's less than that because it's the porch. You, you're down to about a six foot headroom. I, I recall now that you'd have. So careful of cold sellers. If it's uh if it's conditioned, it's not exactly a cold cellar anymore, is it? Unless you put a a cooling unit in it. <laughs> yeah, you know, you're probably better off to buy a wine fridge. Exactly. Just saying. Uh, continuing on, stack the bathrooms or design a common wet wall can be a bit trickier than it sounds though, right? Uh, but you can save a fair bit of material labor and space if you can get your plumbing to be in one spot. If you have to put the ensuite to the back, right? And some in some designs, it just it's going to make sense that that's where it's going to go. Uh, try and avoid putting it to the back, but if you have to, and you're putting in a sanitary stack back there, uh, if you're in clay, you might want to get your excavator to dig out the main stack run, the main the main line for the plumbing, because if you're in clay and you put a plumber down there and you got a little bit of aggregate in there and he's got to dig that out on a hot sunny day, you best be bringing him a couple of buckets of ice water because he's going to be toast by the end of that day. It is not a fair thing to do to a worker, right? Um, so I, I just prefer that if we're going to do that, we, we have the excavators already there. He's taken one scoop basically and he's done, right? Um, window placement and size is another one. And if you've got a stairwell, you know, especially a U-shaped stairwell or even a straight up set of stairs, if there's no windows in that space because of where it's showing up in the design, it's on the side of the home. Look at adding a window. They're, they're not very, and you don't need three and you don't need one, two, three, all fancy like you need a window right? Just to bring some light into that room. So a three by three or a 42 by 42 is adequate. And that's going to make that space really welcoming and warm, right? I also recommend uh, changing at least one basement out, a window out to an egress window. We, we typically put a, uh, I think it's a 48 by 32 in as our standard uh, inclusion on every home, nice window well with it. And the reason for that is, is because if you ever have a catastrophic fire, fire on the main floor, even a big guy like me, I'm getting my tail out that window, right? But if you're only into like, you know, a, a 30 by 18, 30 by 16, 36 by 24, I can't get out of that window, you know, like that. If that's my only way out, I'm in serious trouble. The other thing is, is it helps keep the occupant code compliant if they decide to finish their basement later on. So it's a few hundred dollars more, but well worth it. Okay, the next one's fun. Walls. Who needs wall stuff? Why do we put walls in houses anymore? Well, we do need walls, right? That's the challenge with open concept designs. It might be king, but your HVAC contractor, he's like, oh, wow, where am I going here? It's not so bad if it's just a bungalow, but when you're talking two stories and you got to find how to get everything up to the second floor, it can really be a challenge, right? So also depending on the HVAC system you're using and you're going to see more and more builders, and we're going to talk about this next week, but more and more builders are moving to interior wall high throw. It's a much better delivery system. So you need walls for that, right? Uh, all of this has got to go someplace and, you, you know, not having walls makes it a lot more difficult to figure out where to go. So we've figured out a ton of tricks for how to make that work, including, you know, defining rooms with, with you know, um, columns and bulkheads that are really, they're there for helping with the mechanical systems. So you're still getting that open feel, but a little bit more of a defined space that's actually hiding your mechanical systems. And some builders have really got that dialed in. Others may not have really realized it's a problem because they're just you know, adding costs and getting over it, right? But it's an opportunity to, you know, actually charge a little bit more for aesthetics, but it's actually there for a specific reason. Uh, for the exterior, again, limit the inclusion of bump outs and cantilevers. They add costs and complexity. And the cantilever might be the worst invention we've almost ever had, really. Unless you get it really right, it's a real source of problems. Uh, the next thing is, is can the same effects be uh, created by veneer changes? And I'd like to suggest that it's quite easy to do that. And we do it a fair bit now. Uh, it reduces the complexity on, on the build itself. And uh, I've noted these items here in the fourth presentation. We're going to really get into more detail on things like advanced framing, total value engineering, and, and waste reduction when we look at lean concepts. They are very much so integrated in what we should be doing on our, on our construction framing. But for today's exercise, I've noted that we're gonna to touch base with those on, on the fourth session. 
Oh my goodness, I get to have another drink of water. Will you do a poll, a poll question here? Yes, actually, we've had a few uh, questions come in. And uh, so I'll just remind everyone, if you wouldn't mind putting your questions in the Q&A uh, um, feature at the bottom, that just makes it a little bit easier to manage. But we do have a couple. And then I'll launch the poll. Do you, do you want to take a couple questions right now? Or do you want me to just I do think, I think we're doing OK, sure. Yeah, OK. Um, so the first question is, does an open concept layout hurt in terms of uh, zoning for comfort? It can. Um, the, the challenge with the open concept layout is how are you doing your, your supplies and your returns? So if you're doing open concept layout and you're, and you're doing the design on the floor and it's like, you know, a massive open space, uh, then the, the, having the mechanicals on the floor, your, your vents on the floor can, can be accommodated for that. If you've got space above that is where it really becomes a challenge. So open concept main floor, two story, you're trying to get up to that space it can really cause some challenges design-wise. And that's where you may end up having to put in a, a doubled wall in order to get your runs up to the next floor. And then you might have to look at open web uh, floor joist in order to be able to get where you need to go. And flex ducting really starts to play a role in that type of design. Uh, again, when we're looking at zoning, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in the next session, uh, I always like to start with controlling uh, your, your energy gains from, from solar, um, but, but absolutely you can make zoning work if you're prepared to add a wider wall to get up to the next floor and if you can have open web uh, floor joists. Not a problem on a bungalow usually. Uh, a couple of other questions that came in. Uh, one individual said, uh, could you speak to window wells? They had heard uh, an insurance industry uh, speak at a conference stating that they should avoid window wells because of flooding risks? Well, here's the thing is that when, when you're looking at the window well, uh, if you've got an overland flow route, you shouldn't be putting a window on that side anyway. And, and it's not uncommon in occasional subdivision design to see what's called an overland flow route laid out on the plan. And that typically is going to limit the, the size and the depth of the window on that side anyway. Uh, but, but really, it comes down to what we talked about in the first session, which is how to get water away from the building itself, right? So you want to manage the water flow away from the building first and foremost. Your window well still has to be installed and properly drained. Uh, it's a critically important point. But if you're looking at bulk water flooding in there, well, there is a little bit of a solution that's a bit different. And it's actually providing some safety because some of these window wells can be fairly deep if you're into an egress window. So it's balancing the need of... Uh, flood safety, and if you're in a flood zone, you, you, you may wanna look at doing raised ranch instead or higher, like no basement. But if you're talking about a basement window well, uh, we're using the Bowman Kemp window well. And what I like about this is if needed, uh, you can actually have a grill that goes on top of it that you can stand on. And there's also a plastic uh, a cover, right? That you can put on top of it. And so we actually use those during construction so that nobody falls in because we're concerned about people's safety on that. But certainly that plastic cover put on top, if there's a big, big rain, is going to prevent you from having a lot of water collect in there, right? But if you've properly installed your aggregate down to your weepers, then you should be able to make that work. And as someone who lives in one of your net zero ready homes, Doug, um, what I like also about that window well is that it has a beautiful uh, stone pattern printed on the inside. So it has a really nice view from the inside versus just the silver corrugated. So <laughs> well, if you've ever, if you've ever been down to down south and hear the steel drums, that's what I think of with a typical big window well It's like, OK, I'm, I'm hearing that in my head is the steel drums going off. Right. And, and I love that sound. but not when I'm in a basement in southwestern Ontario. That makes me kind of feel weird, right? So I do agree with you. We actually chose that window well in part because of that. And it's also structurally a really strong window well. Exactly. So it, it has all the, the check boxes. Um, we do have a few more questions, but maybe uh, I'll do the poll and then we can come back to that. Uh, okay, so the next poll question is, just give me a second here. So what we wanna know is, uh, what size of home are your customers uh, requesting the most? And if you're not a builder or you're not working for uh, a builder, like say as a designer or something like that, um, then just hit the not applicable at the bottom. Let's 
So that, uh, about 50% of the attendees have uh, responded so far. That's really interesting, the sizes that are coming in, because that is in the not so big house range for the majority. So I'll share those results. So not applicable is the, the most. So so uh, that's just people that don't uh, have, have this applying to them. But uh, yeah, it looks like 1,500 to 2,000 uh, square feet is is the winner there. Did we have another question here? Or we did. Uh, we do. OK, let me just stop sharing the results here. All right. Um, Yes, uh, let's see. This one's about what their portfolio yeah. is. Good, yeah, I ended up creating two different uh, poll questions here. So uh, this one's a little bit more complicated. So of your portfolio, what we're looking at is what percentage are singles, towns, mid-rise and um, we've just got two categories so zero to 50 percent uh, and then 50 to 100 percent so we just want to get a sense of what you're building and uh, what percentage of your portfolio that is and if you're building something other than singles towns or mid-rise then that's where the other is and uh, you could just put it in the chat uh, what else you're building well so it looks like we've got a little bit of everything here doug I'll just wait another second or two for more responses to come in. All right. Okay, I'll share those results. So it looks like um, uh, singles um, have the highest percentage there with towns, uh, towns right in behind there. Cool. All righty. Okay, energy modeling. So now we have to convert what we want to build into something that makes sense for a building program. Just got to drop this off. So why do energy modeling when the Energy Star R2000 net zero program stuff all have prescriptive baselines for mandatory minimum energy efficiency requirements? So is the OBC and now the new NBC step code. Uh, as I say, it's because when you're doing prescriptive, it's basically it's designing for dummies, right? Uh, you're, you're leaving a lot on the table that you can do more effectively if you start to look at performance. So uh, these are mandatory minimum paths and they may be a really great starting point for getting your team's head wrapped around where you need to go. And any builder that's gone through the Energy Star program or even now in Ontario with the code and in, in, uh, in BC with the step code, they've probably got a pretty decent idea about what the mandatory minimums are. Um, you don't have to put a lot of thought into it. You just basically you're cooking a recipe, right? But you're going to spend more money than needed and likely have performance issues that you can avoid, right? Uh, however, these programs and codes also have performance targets. And once you understand the general concepts, which the prescriptive lays out, you're likely to quickly want to move over to doing performance path. And, and that seems to be a, a significant trend in the industry uh, with the energy advisors. They're doing more and more of the performance path work. So energy modeling of the homes you have chosen for review should come in a few stages. Your uh, energy advisor will want to model the proposed plans for review prior to your first team review meeting. So don't give them 50, right? Uh, and that's gonna set the benchmark for the homes and your EA should come to the meeting with recommendations on how the homes can be improved and your sub trades uh, giving them a starting point for their homework assignment, right? Cause you're gonna wanna get feedback from your trades and your, your site guys, right? Well, what's the benefit of doing all this extra work, right? Because it is more work. It's being able to process and begin the process with a plan. Uh, it is time consuming and difficult to take the first steps without your energy modeling in place and having potential options for consideration. It makes it much easier when you're coming in with an overview of a plan to look at. It's also critical in my mind that your EA look at this from a holistic standpoint with the house as a system whole home approach like I've been advocating for this afternoon. And in speaking with an industry leading builder, I, I really like this story. This is a gentleman, uh, his friend from the United States. And he lamented to me one time as we were having a chat about the fact that he'd asked his designers to design him the most effective wall that his trades would be able to build, right? And he says, you know, I, I really should have asked him to build, to design me the most effective wall system. He said most effective wall and what he should have said was the most effective wall system. 
So what happened is, is he ended up with an R44 wall, double, double wall. You know, some of us are starting to look at that sort of thing now, but he had terrible windows that allowed a huge amount of heat loss and heat gain. So he had high, high heating loads in the, in the winter time and then massive, massive cooling loads in, in, the, summer, in the summertime when the solar gains were, were really hammering through on that. And that caused him to have an outsized HVAC system as well as significant comfort complaints. So his comment was in this particular case, if his team had been asked to design the best wall system, he'd have put less money into the wall and more into the windows. His energy performance would have then have been greatly increased. Uh, the HVAC system would have been right sized or more correctly right sized and the occupant would have not had to put blinds on the windows, uh, which you know not only limits the comfort and, and causes overheating. If you don't, uh, if you've got a nice view and you've got to put blinds on it, you've lost your view. So you spend 500 grand or more on a house and you don't have a view. Wow, that, that doesn't make sense to me. But anyway, so um, my personal experience in looking at energy modeling is don't expect to get it perfect the first time when you're looking at walls and the whole home as a system. We've been on a t you know almost 20 year journey on this really. Uh, for example, working with the team at Building Knowledge, yeah, yeah, I think we know those guys, it took us several iterations over a number of years to get the most cost effective wall system for us that our collective trades and staff could build, right? And part of this was stepping up to higher energy efficiency requirements and part was gaining the collective knowledge to build the wall system effectively. So understanding how it went together. Remember this, this book that I'm dealing with didn't exist back then. It was, some of it was very piecemeal. Uh, for example, when we first went to, to Net Zero and working with, uh, and it was actually working with Andy, our wall system was a two by six wall with a two inch uh, rigid insulation on the outside of it. Uh, really a great wall, but it did mean that uh, there was extra effort from going to R5 to R10 and it meant that our foundation wall went from a nine inch foundation wall to a 10 inch foundation wall. So there was added cost there uh, that we, we had to deal with. So over time we decided, well, let's tear this wall apart a bit. And we came to find that with the modeling, we found that we could get a vapor barrier on the outside and have the right amount of insulation on the outside by going with an inch and a half or, or our, our, seven, uh, our seven and a half on the wall, right? And that worked quite well. So that meant that we were able to stay with a nine inch foundation wall, which is significant savings. It was, I think the total effect was more than 2000. Now, one, one, one bugaboo point here, stuff that I'm gonna have to address is before I start getting a whole bunch of like, well, why aren't you using polyisocyanurate? Because an inch and a half, you're gonna get the R10. Stop. That product is not meant and should not be being used in Canada. It is for conditioning, cooling climates, right? So the, the foil uh, insulation, uh, foil covering of the insulation, when that insulation gets cold, it has a significant reduction in actual thermal performance. So there's enough research out there that says, don't use that product here. It's still in the codes, it's still permissible, but talk to your EA. In my mind, that should not be being offered in Canada for, for outside exterior walls. And we've, we've got to stop using products that, that don't work, right? Um, and if you do energy uh, thermal imaging with that in the wintertime, you will see that there's a difference in that product. So not recommended. It's, it's a real drop off. Okay. Uh, energy performance modeling. So this is where your energy advisor is going to come on board. And he's going to hopefully be able to review with you some type of table. He, she is going to give you some type of table to look at. It should show you baseline consumption, which is the top of the second right column. And it's showing us that this, this design was coming in at 119 gigajoules, okay? Uh, it should also indicate the gigajoule savings for the additional items that you're being considered. So you're running down a pick list to get to a point where you've saved enough. The exercise here is to save enough to reduce the number of solar panels that have to go on the roof to a point where they match. You can have a limited amount of gigajoules needed to run the home, and you can put the offsetting amount of gigajoules on the roof with your solar, right? So this looked at dropping down uh, by almost 50 gigajoules in its consumption, and uh, that was a, a, or about 
And that was reducing it by about $11,500 added cost, right? So, so to get that consumption reduction, it was about $11,500 in this example. Uh, now, some energy advisors may include approximate cost for this. You may have to take it back to your, your pricing department and have your, your team uh, rip, rip that open and see what it actually costs. Uh, but the table may also show supplemental additional items for consideration. So you've gotten to this point here and you can continue to go further if you so desire, right? So if you're looking at doing an energy positive home, you may have to factor in a few more points, right? Uh, really special thanks to Jack Zhu uh, and the team at AJAC for providing this for us and the, some of the really cool work they're doing. So a shout out to those guys, right? Okay. Next up is knowing your energy and that's air leakage, right? So our desired outcome here is in order to reduce your energy consumption enough to build a net zero home, you need to consistently build every home under, I say one air change, but one and a half air change is actually the code or the energy star, net, the net zero requirement. I say one because it gives you a, a, a bleed factor if you miss a house, right? Uh, that is significantly less than a, than a code home and still less than the 2.5 that's in Energy Star. What's the benefit? Air leakage is where the largest energy losses occur. So it makes sense to address this first, right? But there's also numer addi numerous additional benefit stuff for when you get your air leakage under control. You can downsize your HVAC system for heating and cooling. And then working with your HVAC contractor though, uh, these benefits can bring the overall HVAC cost down if they understand the right size and concept, right? The other benefit is to your customer. By reducing air leakage, you're actually creating, creating a more comfortable home and a greater ability to maintain consistent indoor air temperatures. In other words, you're not having drafts that are gonna cause certain parts of the home to get out of whack. So when somebody asked earlier about zoning, do this first and get this under control and then, and then zoning is less needed, right? So the, the zoning is not necessarily a, a bad thing. I'm not advocating against it. I'm just saying there's other things that need to happen first. So when we look at this chart that's included here, by dropping down on air changes from three to even one air changes, a code home is dropping from 113 gigajoules to 96, just by making that one change. A typical net zero home is going from 52 to 43. The difference between those two is the amount of panels you've got to put on the roof. There's not a huge difference between one and 0.6, and that's why I advocate to you know get it so that you're clearing one and then you're good, right? But that's why energy is important because it's a big savings. It's it's that bit of difference for how much you got to put on the roof. You know what else uh, uh, ha has an advantage for air tightness? What doesn't come in through the the uncontrolled cracks is uh, dust, pollen, allergens, and um, the nice thing about that is. Um, there's actually, you're not required to dust quite as frequently. You know, <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> you shouldn't really use your, your walls as a dust collector. It's not a great solution. It's not, not, it's not meant to be a filter. Filter mm -hmm. needs to be on the furnace, really. That's in, in your ERV or HRV, depending yeah, on what you're using. Exactly. Um, so the next thing is the case for compartmentalizing, right? And often I hear about builders struggling to get under even four air changes an hour for their semis in their towns. And most of that is attributable to being leaks between the units, right? And so I remember a few years back and we were getting into semis in a big way. And I presented this detail to the building officials and they flagged and said, no, you can't build that. And I said, why? And they said, well, because you have to have, you know, a, a continuous fire separation and I, I said, well, no, that's not really true. I have to have continuous fire system, right? Separation system. So you can actually build components to do that. And we did a lot of work on it. And I finally had to, to get an engineer to get it proved that it worked, although I knew it worked. And when I spoke to my friend, Jamie Yukowski, who's building official here in St. Thomas, and, and this is where he went forward with the approvals with me on it, as I said, Jamie, um, I want you to let me do this. And he says, but Doug, you don't need to do this. I said, well, look, I'm, I wanna put this air barrier. And if you force me to do continual drywall right through at the time it was at, at the garage wall, I can't do a continuous air barrier. And he says, but, but you don't need to do that for code. And it says, well, oh, Jamie, I'm not building the code, right? This is where we differ in our thinking is I'm not building the code. I like to get off and do these alternative compliance things. You're worried about fire. 
And you see what I'm worried about is smoke because the smoke's gonna kill you way before the fire ever gets to you. Oh, that's a good point. And that brings me up to a, a, a point that I'd like to raise is that work with your building officials through this process. In fact, if it's at all possible in your charrette, have them in the room. Have them understand right from the beginning what your, what your objectives are and it makes it a lot easier to get acceptance. So by doing this separation, our typical detail has been coming in at under one air change an hour for semis and towns where I know most builders aren't getting under four typically, right? Um, so the thought is, if you can smell your neighbors cooking, you got a problem. Uh, it also reduces noise transfer stuff, which is a good thing. And I know our, I, we've got some mutual friends that live in a couple of semis we built and they just love it because it's you know a lot quieter, right? Uh, so quickly, a party wall detail. This is uh, from building knowledge on the left-hand side, rock, rock wool now detail on the right-hand side. They're both commonly available details, and you know there's there's lots of this out in the marketplace now. But the days of having the concrete block in between, you know, we really probably want to avoid that. It's a terrible detail, and it adds it adds complexity to the schedule too, because now you got to get a bricky to come in and do that type of work, as opposed to the framers do this for us, and we just keep right on rocking, right? So the idea is to have uh, this sealed like it's uh, an exterior wall. You want to have a common air barrier uh, on the one side. We put poly on one and we put like a smart membrane on the other to allow some dryability, right? Uh, just continuation, this is a different variation. This is at the, the uh, an intersecting wall between the party wall and then the intersecting wall at, uh, at the exterior wall interface, right? So the idea being is, is that we're creating a continuous air barrier with this product. Okay, however, um, there's a lot that can go wrong on the job site that will negatively affect uh, how you're going to do on your ceiling. And especially with towns and semis, getting your air tightness under one and a half is, is going to be potentially challenging for you. You've got in issues ranging from, you know, trade consistency, especially if you're into unionized uh, build shops, uh, attention to detailing, especially if you make it more complex. Challenging housing types and details that can affect your ability to consistently hit this number, right? There's a lot that impacts on it. So with many builders struggling uh, with this, I'd like to say, you know what, there is, there is hope, right? How do you fix it? Well, uh, we've been playing around with this stuff for a while, Aero Barrier. And uh, we find it's a game changer, you know, and, you know, Gord's comment here, the most exciting I've ever been for potential of a new product for the industry in many years. And I would concur with Gord. It is, it is a, it's a disruptive technology is what I would call it, you see. Um, so these guys, we've, we've done homes with them for quite a bit now. Uh, the semis especially, we're finding fantastic results, but they're in and out in about three hours and a good portion of that time is their setup, right? What I really like about it though, is that you're able to get reports from them and you can actually use this to show your air tightness with your building officials to prove that you've actually got a continuous air barrier which is a code required inspection set. So the, the building officials, if they're willing, can take that report and say, I've done a visual inspection, I'm good. I've seen that this is complete and you're good to rock and roll. So the results shown here is we took a semi-detached home that we were actually slightly high on. We we're at 1.32 air changes per hour. And after what was just less, uh, just a little bit more than two and a half hours, they had it down to 0.22 air changes stuff. 0.22 air changes. That's like what, a boat that big? Uh, that's really small. Yeah. The entire that's home. Impressive, actually. <laughs> so uh, to the point where, well, I won't say, <laughs> I won't say what one person said, but it had to do with passing gas, right? So you definitely want to make sure that, you know, when you're closing the door, that it doesn't ro rattle the windows. It is really tight. It's tighter than it really needed to be. But uh, I'm advocating that because when we're looking at a, a party wall design buildings, it makes it a lot safer and it cuts down on noise transference. Uh, but we have actually backed the spec off and said, get it under one and we're happy, right? We've had a, a number of questions come in, uh, a couple of which are on uh, aero barrier and sure, aero seal. Sure. Do you want to take those? Okay. Um, so one question is, uh, has aero barrier been tested long-term and how long do they anticipate it will last? Uh, it's actually been around uh, in use as aerosol for quite a while, and uh, it, it's it's going to last basically like paint lasts. Really, it, it's it's not going to fade off. 
What I can do um, as well is um, in our resource email that we send out at the end, I will look to get some information on that as well that I can send a link. Okay, um, one more question, Steph. I got to keep an eye on the time here because we're we're coming up on one hour now already. No problem. So uh, it is actually on arrow seal. Can you comment on arrow seal for ducks in 20 year old homes and arrow barrier for 60 year old double brick homes that are being gutted? Um, best wall insulation system for the double brick, that sort of thing. Okay, so I'm going to suggest that I'll, I'll get you some answers back on on that double brick wall later. Um, okay. Yes and yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's, you know what, you can try and go in and do the taping of, uh, of your ducks. But if they're not all exposed, it's really difficult to get to it. It's a great technology for, for being able to seal things up. And that's about getting the air where it needs to be, which we're going to cover in the third session. Uh, as far as the arrow barrier in an older home, you just got to protect your horizontal surfaces. All right, let's keep rocking here. Uh, oh, hey, listen, we just hit a poll question. Oh, That's you. I'm on mute. There we go. Uh, okay. On average, what air tightness uh, levels are you hitting in your homes? And uh, so I've broken it out into detached and attached because sometimes the performance can be different. And if this doesn't apply to you, um, uh, you can put NA, or if you're not air testing, you can uh, uh, answer that at the bottom there. Looks like we're getting a little bit of a mix on all the different results here. So we'll just wait for a few more answers to come in. Now, Steph, they all get a copy of these uh, poll results when you send out everything? Um, I haven't been because um, the way uh, it does, it doesn't come as pretty as this does. Uh, it comes in a very difficult to manage um, ex cumbersome Excel document. <laughs> Screenshot. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's uh, here. I'll do that right now. All yeah, right. Very so cool. Polling and I will share the results. So it looks like on detached, uh, quite a number of people are getting, um, uh, let's see, uh, the one and a half air changes level and then on attached in and around the two and a half. Okay, so that, that's expected. Uh, a portion, about 16% are not air testing and, um, and a number of people uh, it doesn't apply to. Okay, and did we have a second question here? No, we didn't. The optimal oh, wall. Yeah. What's that? That was it. Okay, all right, so the optimal wall. Um, in choosing the optimal wall, uh, getting it right might take a few tries. And so what I'd like to say is that continuous insulation is, is really critically important in order to reduce thermal bridging. Um, some builders are still doing like a uh, two by six R22 wall type of thing and, and making up their performance elsewhere. Um, it, it does come with a concern though when you're looking at, at doing continuous insulation and that really comes down to uh, water management and air sealing getting increasingly important, especially as I talked in the last session, if you got poly on the inside and foam on the outside. Um, it's not just about reducing energy efficiency to building a very tight home. It's about building a home that's more durable and longer lasting. So again, training your site supers becomes critically important. And, and what we're looking at there is managing to avoid water and, and air leakage into the home. Uh, one thing is, is when you start to get into greater amounts of insulation though, as I said before, you could end up having a 10 inch foundation wall, unless as I've shown in this diagram here, your market would be willing to look at doing, a, you know, say a hardy siding or some type of that on the outside, in which case, you know, you can probably get it down to uh, an eight inch foundation wall instead of a nine inch and, and still have the two inches of foam on the top. What we've landed on is inch and a half with a nine inch foundation wall. But if we do hardy, it does drop down to eight for that little bit of savings. Okay. Um, the next thing is, is it nominal or is it effective? So when we're looking at nominal R value, effectively that's what's stamped on the bag, right? You know, if it says R20, that's a nominal value. When we're looking at whole wall effective R value, that's considering all the components in the wall assembly. So advanced framing actually plays uh, an impact on your overall insulated value by putting more insulation into the wall. Windows also have a significant impact on the total wall effective R value, okay? So I figured I wanted to know how to do it. I got bored one day and so I built my, uh, my own uh, effective wall calculator. This is a version of it right here. And it's actually calculating out what my effective value was uh, on a specific wall that we were looking at. And so you're looking at all the components and it gets added up on your effective R value. 
um, on, the, on the far right hand column here. And so when you're looking at the stud cavity, there's actually a formula for stud to insulation ratios that would calculate out then. In this particular case, it was just under 11 uh, R value. Because, um, you know, when I'm bored stuff, I do stupid things like this. But then I, I took it a little bit further and you know, wanted to look at what the effect of windows was on here. So this is actually looking at a 25 foot long by eight foot wall, which is about 200 square feet. And it had two four by three windows or 24 feet of uh, windows squared. And so the R value effectively of the windows was 2.86. The wall itself was 18.34. And this is a code window and code wall, right? And it dropped down to 11.12. So your R18 effective R value, which is what an R22 wall is dropping down to half, it's, it's 11, right? Just by adding those two windows. When I look at changing that to adding just an OBC window into a better improvement wall, I used my net zero wall, it was up to 13. And then when I looked at a higher performing window, which in this case was, I think an R, R effective R value is just over R4, uh, you're up to almost 16. So it's a significant improvement overall by having a better wall, but also looking at your windows, right? That's a big impact. So then these guys, my friends over there at the Canadian Wood Council came out with this really cool calculator. I'm not going to go through it right now, but I'm telling you, it is really cool and it's easy to use. And they have over 16,000 walls you can look at in their program and they're building it all the time. What I do want to show is, so they're going to give you a detailing like this to show you what's what's actually happening in the wall. What I do want to show is this slide right here, which is when you compare the wall durabilities. Now, my program does not do this. Mine is very, very simple because I had a couple hours to spare, right? This one right here, and you're looking at different municipalities throughout the country, uh, and you're looking at what's called a simulated durability analysis, right? And so the top chart is showing with smart vapor retarders and the bottom chart is showing poly vapor barrier, right? So why I'm excited about this is because it's showing um, exactly what our research when we did the Argyle project with George Brown showed, which is beware of poly, right? And so when we're looking at this, when you start looking at smart vapor retarders and you're giving a driability path, it really improves performance overall of that wall and the long-term durability of that wall, more importantly. Because if insulation gets wet, it's not real good, right? It doesn't work very well when it's wet. Most insulations don't. Uh, website for how to go find that calculator is right here, okay? All right, solar ready. <clears throat> so we've been doing this for a long time. I think it was back in 2008 that our company wrote the first ever solar ready spec for Natural Resources Canada under contract. And uh, since then we've done hundreds of solar ready homes. A few years ago, we transitioned over to solar PV because the writing was on the wall that there just isn't any money in solar thermal, which is heating your hot water. Uh, the roofs typically are not gonna have enough space to do both uh, effectively. If you've got a bigger roof and can do both, great. But the cost to value ratio was really on PV. Um, so what we did is we decided that we were going to survey all of our roofs and we went and we'd spent the time. We actually worked with Blue Water, which is Will's company coming up and we, we surveyed all our roofs. And I highly recommend this as an exercise for the builders in the room uh, to figure out how many panels would fit and then compare that to your net zero target. Do I have enough panels to match my energy loads, right? And why I like that is because it saves a lot of headaches of figuring it out on the fly later on because you've already known and you whip it through eight points of the compass. So you do it eight times for each house and you're done, right? It doesn't matter how you orientate it, where you put it there. The only thing you have to look out for is shading by big trees or if you've got a large building beside it. Uh, beyond that, then we've done over the years, many solar installs. So um, I see there's more questions coming in, but can we leave them till the end? Yes. <laughs> okay, great. I want to take the time right now to introduce uh, Will Beardmore. I'm really pumped to have him here with us today to join to talk about installing solar. Uh, Will is uh, not only a friend, but he is president and founder of Blue Water Energy, one of our most uh, established renewable energy companies here in Ontario with over 12 years of experience doing installs. Their firm offers expertise in solar PV, battery storage, backup generators. He's done one of those with us as well. Power distribution and energy monitoring systems. 
Uh, he's also consulting with the CHBA Net Zero MERB program and the participating builders, and he's our preferred installer. So I think I get to turn it over to Will now. Is he there? Yeah. Can you hear me, Doug? I can hear you. Yeah. All right. Awesome. I'm, uh, I'm just going to leave my camera off because we don't need it. I'm going to share my screen and go into a presentation, but thank you very much for the introduction. Will? Uh, it's very, very difficult to hear you. Is it? Okay. One yeah. Here. Um, there. How's that? Is that better? Oh, much better. Yes. Thank you. Okay. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, okay. Thank you very much for the introduction, Doug. My camera is off right now just because my internet speeds are a little bit slow and I don't want uh, that to be the reason why we're lagging here at all. Um, can I share my screen? I can. All right. Yes. You should be able so to share your screen. So, how's that look? See that stuff? Yep. Okay, awesome. So I understand that uh, you know we have not a lot of time here. Um, I do have a fair amount of information, but it's going to be very high level. And then uh, Doug, you and I are going to have a little conversation following this brief presentation. In addition to that, I'm also going to uh, to sort of tee up everyone on this call with a very uh, valuable and, and awesome resource that Enercan has just published, which is a solar PV uh, decision guide and matrix, which will help sort of solidify the information in this uh, presentation. So what we're going to talk about here, uh, the PV design process, and then I'm going to break out things uh, according to design phase, construction phase, and commissioning phase with respect to putting solar PV on a, on a home, special considerations, and then I'll uh, just review the net metering policy and how that works very quickly. And then we'll, we'll hopefully have some time for questions. Um, so the design process. So Doug's alluded to this. Uh, we did this with, uh, with um, all of the homes uh, that Doug was focusing on in his, one of his recent developments and, and making them that's already. And essentially what it is, is we model um, every home, every elevation, every lot, meaning every orientation within the development. Okay, so it's important in the design process to start working with the PV consultant closely and early to ensure the home can get to net zero. Um, and then if you find that you cannot on first uh, on the first attempt, then you have time to adjust the home or the roof design. And I'll talk about those two things as we go. The major steps when it comes to the design process. So we've got a preliminary PV design and generation model that is based on the house design and lot orientation. So the builder um, has to provide the drawing set to the PV consultant who can then take that, um, scale it, model it, see how much solar can get on uh, each of the different roof planes, um, and then create a generation model based on the pitch and the orientation of those roof planes. And then if necessary, there needs to be um, a, a step that goes uh, through the adjustment of the PV design, the adjustment of the roof, if necessary, and or the adjustment of the, you know, the house design and the mechanicals. And there's a trade-off between adding more PV on the roof and um, improving the performance of the home through performance improvement measures or, you know, improvement, uh, improving mechanicals. And, and so, you know, a good PV consultant can help you do the financial comparison between what will it cost to add another PV module to increase generation if we go that route, what would be the cost to uh, implement more in, uh, improvement, performance improvement measures? If we go that route, compare those two and then pick the option that's best for you. And then following that, we, we'll end up with a final PV design and generation model. And then we go into, um, if you're going full net zero, you know, a rough, in, a rough in stage, a construction phase and a commissioning and handover phase. And so we start with, uh, you know, a, a plan set that shows the roof plan. We turn that into a scaled 3D model. So that picture that Doug showed that we had done uh, many years ago now at this point um, was how we used to do things. And now we've improved so that we can actually get um, a scaled 3D model. And then out of that, we get our generation forecast, which uh, once we plug in the information from the energy model, we determine how close we're going to get to the offset of that energy and our targets 100% for net zero. So during the, the design phase, obviously we require an energy model from the home, from your energy advisor. And then the PV design is gonna essentially um, 
figure out how to generate an equivalent amount of energy on site, which is the net zero requirement. So we're going to take into consideration roof design, pitch orientation, and the available area per photovoltaics, architectural constraints, so dormers, hips, valleys, etc. Those things take up space. Uh, solar modules are rectangular and that shape is, is not, um, not adjustable. So we have to work within the limitations that we have. Type of roof, shingles, steel, standing seam. Uh, there are uh, benefits to metal roofs and there's benefit to the standing seam roof in that we don't have to actually penetrate. Selection of equipment, PV modules, power electronics. Uh, the PV array layout and the generation model. Uh, we also want to have a wire plan if, if we're combining multiple sub arrays on the roof. So if, you know, typically speaking, if I sort of quickly go back to this here, uh, a typical single detached residential home that's going net zero is going to have to use more than one roof. And so we have to combine the power generation from these sub arrays and we have to do that smartly so we don't have cables and things when we're uh, crossing um, ridges and, and uh, hips and things like that. We're going to talk about that shortly. Additional design capacity in the roof for the weight of PV. Uh, it, this is something that is kind of obvious, but is, is sometimes overlooked. So it's important to note that solar uh, is going to add about three pounds per square foot to the, uh, to the weight of the roof, and that needs to be factored into the design. And then a net meter application and LDC connection authorization, or those are administrative requirements and are going to be necessary if you plan a net meter. And then your monitoring equipment, what equipment's going in, um, and what it's actually going to do for you. And then during the construction phase, uh, and in the construction, I'm incorporating the rough in. So essentially, we want to make sure that, you know, as I, as I uh, referenced earlier, if we have multiple arrays on different pitches and different, um, different roof planes of the home, we have to combine the output from those sub arrays somehow. And we don't want cables running on the exterior of the roof. So really what we want, what we're talking about here is pre-wiring the roof um, or at least making provisions with roof entries so that we can actually combine those arrays in the attic and we don't have cables running on the exterior. Um, DC cable from the attic to within about five feet either side of the main electrical panel. And this is essentially gonna bring the power from the roof down to the inverter. And we say five feet either side of the main electrical panel because, you know, in some cases, the straight run from the attic down to the basement of the, you know, the sort of the utility room is not always a direct one. And so, um, you know, we don't want to end up 45 feet away from the panel. Inverter clearances, we do need a standard uh, one meter in front. So in your mechanical room, if you're thinking about where the inverter is going to go, we need a meter in front of that as we would with any other electrical panel according to um, code. So that's something to be aware of because we've seen, uh, we've planned it out and we've sort of gone to do the, the installation of the inverter and we find an ERV and HRV hanging from the ceiling that uh, basically sits right in front of where the inverter is planned to go and doesn't give us that one meter. AC conduit installed from the inverter to the switch outside, which is this guy here. And what you want to think about is, is that we need two inch and a quarter conduit coming out to the switch. One is coming out from the inverter and that's a penetration through the building envelope into the switch. And then one is going back inside and connecting on the main panel. So that's another penetration. So these penetrations through the building envelope probably want to be done during construction so they can be sealed up and, and uh, aren't going um, aren't to violate the integrity of the building afterwards. Um, room for the outdoor switch, you can see it can get pretty tight here. We do need this switch to be within one meter of the meter base. That's the code requirement. And then ceiling penetration to the building envelope. Um, so just think about how the PV installer is going to access the site and access the roof. Um, you know, we can work off ladders to a limited extent. Genie lifts are better. And then obviously there's a challenge of getting genie lifts down the side of a house or in the backyard. So it's all things that need to be thought about. Coordination with other trades. Um, this, you know, for example, the roofers, because they're putting roof vents on the roof, the plumbers, they're, they're putting their plumbing stacks through the roof. Anybody else that's venting mechanicals, anything um, that's going through the roof, they need to have a copy of the PV design so they know where the solar modules are going. So they're not putting um, their things uh, in the way. And we've seen that happen. So it's, it's a serious point to sort of make sure you cover and leave a double slot at the bottom of the main electrical panel for the solar breaker. And I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. 
commissioning. So this is the systems installed and we're gonna turn it all on. So first of all, there's an ESA inspection and the ESA then uh, flips connection authorization to the, to the LDC, the hydro company who then says, okay, you're good to go, you can turn it on. And the reason for that is, is it's interacting with the utility. So we do need their authorization to do that. Um, internet is not required at this stage, but it should, if possible, be there so that we can get all the monitoring set up and online at the same time. And then there's a commissioning report that needs to be filled out and sent to the energy advisor because they're the one that's probably gonna be handling your certification as CHBA. Um, we're going to do startup and testing, map the array, and then there needs to be a walkthrough, whether this is with the builder or with ultimately the home buyer, um, just to review what the layout of the system is, where the major equipment is, how to shut the system down safely, how to access the monitoring portal, um, net metering process, and understanding the utility bill. This is a big one, um, and it, there should be something that is left behind with the, the home buyer so that they can understand that and who to, the, who to call in the event of issues and questions. And then special considerations. So this is, you know, obviously electrical panel down here at the bottom of the bus, we need space for a double pole breaker. Um, and then special considerations, we need a minimum of 3.5 PSF in the roof design um, generation. And, and you'll see different numbers here. And I know that uh, our TAN has suggested even up to nine PSF. So really it's a question for your solar consultant and their structural engineer um, to make sure that you're covered. Generation back feed limit is 125% of the panel bus bar rating. And then from that number, you subtract out the rating of the main breaker to find out how many amps we can actually feed back onto the main panel. And it's something you wanna consider. All of these points are covered in much greater detail in the EnterCAN PV decision guide, which I'll show you how to access uh, very shortly here. Ensure there's space in the mechanical room for the inverter near the electrical panel. And ideally we want that inverter um, to be mounted uh, within about five feet of the electrical panel. Uh, you can see from this picture here that it's on an exterior wall. That is also okay. They're rated down to minus 40 degrees Celsius. So it's, it's definitely something that can be done if necessary, but ideally everything's going in the mechanical room. Um, ensure the electrical panel space for the solar breaker. It's going to be a 60 amp or a 10 kilowatt, 60 amp double pole breaker right down here at the bottom. Ensure that conduit cable from the attic terminates at a location of the inverter, about 40 feet away. Uh, plan for conduit runs to the outdoor switch and back ahead of time. And that this is particularly important when the meter is on one side of the home, let's say, and the electrical panel is on the other side of the home and you have to go underneath the garage floor. Um, so that conduit has to go in early to, uh, to be able to make it. And think about cat five from the inverter to the internet router location. Sometimes that's not always known. The, the nice thing is that inter internet routers tend to be sort of put down in the mechanical room near the utility, near the electrical panel. And so that works really well. Okay, so net metering. Um, essentially what we're doing is solar PV is generating renewable energy. That renewable energy goes through the inverter. The inverter converts that from direct current to alternating current and then feeds that onto the main electrical panel in the home. Then when there's excess energy beyond what the home is consuming, it goes out to the grid and the meter registers what is being exported. And then that export is being credited at a one for one rate. So the cost for a kilowatt hour is the, the, the amount of credit that you're getting for every kilowatt hour exported. When the home is consuming more energy than is being produced and we need to pull from the grid, then the meter is obviously registering what you're consuming from the grid. Every month there's a, there's a addition and subtraction there. The homeowner is billed uh, for energy use beyond anything exported and then credits that are not used carry forward for up to 12 months. And so that's how that works. Okay, so this is the EnterCAN and LEAP um, planning and decision guide that I spoke about. It can be downloaded right from the EnterCAN site. Um, if you Google search LEAP PV guide, you'll find it. And then the um, great folks at EnterCAN, Patrick and Alistair, who worked very hard on this, could also answer any questions that you have. But there are going to be some dedicated webinars for this guide. This is something that um, is 
is a great resource for builders. It's an even better resource for builders to sit down and review with the PV consultant or have the PV consultant explain to them so that all of the things that I've touched on in this very brief presentation here um, can be covered to the, to the sufficient amount of detail that you're going to need in order to be successful here. So I'll stop there, open it up to questions, and turn it back to you, Doug. Okay, thanks, Will. That was fantastic. Um, just to continue on, this this is a little Q and A for you and I. This is kind of like you know, as kids when we played t-ball type of thing. But uh, stuff on the roof has an impact, right? So I just wanted to go through like a couple of things here that you you maybe touch base on to to just show this. You couldn't have screwed this house up worse, really. Um, you know, you've got that nice little gable detail in the one corner, and then you've got those big big vents up at the top. Your roof vents. And then there's a couple of little stacks there for um, what I'm assuming would be your, your kitchen uh, because this is a this is actually a semi-detached home and then you have four four windows in your ceiling your skylights right so where are you putting panels on that one Rue? Uh, well well uh, it gets very challenging in in an extreme circumstance like this and ideally this is all taken care of during that uh, preliminary design process where you're, you know, you've got the plan set long before you go to construction, you're working with your PV consultant, you have that, that preliminary or final PV design done, and then you're able to coordinate um, the, the location of all of these things that you see here with your, with your trades very easily from that point. And if you make sure the trades have a copy of that PV design, then, you know, it ensures that we're not going to end up with things sort of placed in the middle of roof areas where we want to put PV modules. So some solutions could have been, one is possibly, I guess, integrating where your, your skylights are going to be within the solar design. Um, that, that maybe could happen or, or don't put them on that orientation if you need it for solar. One would be your, your HVAC venting. Uh, can we get it to someplace else by adding a bit more pipe? The next one is beware of gable ends. And I spoke of my own house there that was on the, the uh, east side uh, that you're gonna screw up the potential for putting solar on. And then lastly, can you look at ridge fence instead, right? So uh, slide number two and stuff, I did see some hands coming up. So we'll probably try and get to some of those. What about townhomes, right? So when you've got semis, town stack towns and MERBs, they can be a little bit different than a single uh, a, a detached home. Uh, in some cases, you may look at having to alter the roof design in order to get enough in the right orientation, especially if your, your uh, architectural restrictions say you can't put solar on the front. And it, depending on if it's east, west, or north, south uh, facing, if south is front and they won't let you put it on there and all you've got is north is a gable end, you may have to switch to hips. Uh, and then depending on your orientation, you may have to uh, look at having uh, north south having a, a, a tighter higher roof pitch on the north and a lower slope on the south to put more roof line out there you run into stuff like that uh yeah in fact we have and um, fortunately uh, to this point we've been able to design our way around the challenges so that um you know we could get the buildings that we're working with to net zero and you have a nice sort of the bottom right is a good illustration of the type of things that can be done where you've got sort of a, a longer pitch running to one side and a shorter, steeper pitch running to the other side. Um, and we have done this type of thing actually, in fact, through the design process in order to open up the, the more efficient facing roof. So the one that is more southerly facing. Um, and then in addition to that, we have worked with builders to, to to determine based on orientation what the optimal pitch is, because the optimal pitch does change depending on what orientation the building is facing. Um, a south facing building optimal pitch is 912, a north facing roof, the optimal pitch is gonna be, you know, much closer to the horizontal, like 10 degrees. So, um, so it matters, orientation matters. And then in terms of working with uh, townhomes, you know, the unique challenges of, of, of having numerous units within one building means that we have to take into consideration 
how we're going to divide up the power generation amongst those units and direct that power to where it has to go. But in the design process, these are things that can absolutely be addressed um, if we start early enough and if the builder has flexibility to work with their architect to make changes that would help increase uh, the generation to where it needs to get. So get your solar designer in with your EA really early in the process. A quick Absolutely. quick comment on these uh, lovely illustrations here. Folks, don't be carving and chirping me here because of, of the illustrations. <laughs> these are just sketches. These are not completed from the book, okay? Uh, I've these got an illustrator. Perfect. I've got these an illustrator perfect. that I'm gonna be working with on this. Yeah, they do I, the I, track, right? I was thinking back to that Mona Lisa picture you showed last week. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so a couple other considerations that you're going to have to work with with uh, with guys like Will is if there's not enough space on south and west, uh, can we put panels on the front of the building if needed? Can we do vertical walls? And we'll just ask you quickly about vertical walls. And uh, what about adding a covered deck to add the space uh, needed, right? Absolutely. Um, we have actually uh, used all of these um, different options here in, in one at one time or another in order to help you know get to the net zero target and so you know vertical walls facing south uh, are are okay vertical walls facing east and west are um, still okay but not as okay vertical walls facing north are pretty much a waste of time so you know you do have to be careful um, about considering orientation for sure when you're doing that we've also worked with some customers to do things like solar awnings um, if you don't have the option for a covered deck, but a covered deck in a number of projects that we've been a part of has been the difference between getting the home to net zero and not and worked out actually very well so that, you know, the homeowner gets the benefit of a covered deck, the home gets to hit the net zero standard, it gets a certification label, um, and it's a, it's a, a unique and um, an interesting way to, to get it there. Cool. All right. Well, Steph, listen, I think we're... Uh... The only thing that we really haven't covered off here is, is the total, uh, total cost of ownership. And this is something that I, I think that we're going to have to start doing a, an overall better job uh, at. One of the challenges is that uh, there's no green mortgages really readily available. Another is uh, net zero ready kind of makes it difficult for us to get all the way to net zero because um, when you're at net zero ready and people are looking at net zero and they're like, well, if it's so good, why, why isn't it included, right? So we've got that argument to overcome a little bit as well. And then uh, we as an industry really need to start sharing better about the value proposition, the numbers, right? The math. And so that's something we're gonna have to look at. So hey, Steph, listen, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to say a special thanks to Will for joining us today. That was really fantastic. I was going to ask him to stick around. I think he's still just off screen right now for a couple of questions. I know we're right on the clock here, uh, but I think we are done except for your last two questions. Yeah, so um, I was just going to let everyone know that it is 2.30 and it looks like we're uh, running a little long. Uh, this is all being recorded and I will send out a resource email afterwards. So if you do need to hop off, uh, that's fine. You will uh, catch it all. And uh, But yeah, if you want to uh, keep on going, we could do this poll and... Um, Anybody that uh, can't uh, stay on the line, they can get it afterwards. So the question is, are your clients asking for PV solar panels? Yes or no, that's the first part of the question. Uh, and the second question, part of the question is, what are the biggest challenges that you're facing when trying to sell the PV panels? And if, is it price, is it aesthetics, is it um, the homeowner's knowledge or lack of knowledge, uh, fear perhaps of new technology, uh, maybe skeptical that, you know, the, the performance isn't what it claims. Um, in the other there, in the other category, if you have some thoughts, write in, write in the chat um, what other things that you're hearing that are challenges on that front. So we'll just wait for, um, uh, yeah, so one says uh, return on investment. Um, uh, lack of solar access on townhomes or a couple of things. Okay, so I'll share what we've got so far here, share the results. Uh, so it looks like the first part of the uh, question is, are your clients asking? So we've got roughly half uh, look to be our um, of the respondents uh, between yes and no. Um, and price looks to be one of the biggest obstacles. 
Uh, it looks like it is, in fact, the biggest obstacle in budget. Very cool stuff. That's some good information to have. Mm -hmm. uh, so today's takeaways then, how big do you need to build? Uh, basements can add added value space. Consider how the client will use their home. Beware of complicating uh, wall detailing. Air sealing to under one and a half air change an hour is critical. Understand effective R value and window impact. Plan your solar design early, minimally before permit stage. Uh, very special thank you again to our sponsors. Webinar series is Enbridge. Uh, Co-pilot is obviously you, stuff and our team at Building Knowledge. Thank you again for them to be involved. Seed funding and origin ideas, Patrick Ladd and Javan at Enercan. Uh, again, my tolerant employer for allowing me the time for this, Dr. Ray Holmes, and my understanding partner as I'm writing several of these on the weekends, my wife, Carolina Craft in Stone Canada. So that's it. We're, we're done, except for maybe a couple of questions. I saw there was some questions coming in, so that's good. Yeah, we have a lot of questions. So just before we tackle a couple of them, um, and Doug, you can let me know how many you'd like to tackle. Um, but uh, I just want to let you know that there were some outstanding questions from last week. Doug has uh, provided me the answers, and I'm just creating a, a document that I will send out to everybody. I'll do the same thing, right? Okay. So we've, yep. we've probably got time for three or four and then we should probably, you know, God bless us. We're over time again. <laughs> yes. I, <don't. laughs> I think you're chatty, Doug. Are you chatty? Well, if you'd stop talking, Doug, we'd get through it faster. <laughs> um, okay. So let's just go to one here. Are there any bylaws that restrict neighbors from shading existing solar panels on a home, such as planting large trees, adding a second floor to a bungalow, things like that. Do you know about that? Well, specifically that would be bylaw. So that's going to be municipality to municipality. Will might have a better answer on that one than I do. Um, I have not seen any yet. And I do not believe, I'm not aware of any municipalities that have actually implemented, um, you know, a sunlight protection um, bylaw into their planning departments. Um, so I'm going to say probably not, but something that, you know, can be checked. Okay. Um, another uh, solar panel uh, PV question is, can a house that currently has a microfit system add more panels as part of a net metering program? Uh, yes, with caveat that uh, as long as the LDC approves the, um, the capacity, so there would have to be a new form C application for the net meter. Um, you're going to want that to be 10 kilowatts or under as well, uh, but it is possible to have a parallel net meter system um, in on the same property as a microfet. Uh, another question for both of you, and this is, uh, well, it is addressed to you, Will, but uh, Doug, you can weigh in as well. Uh, do you have a recommendation of design dead load to carry uh, for PV panels when engineering roof trusses? So for us, it's 3.5 pounds per square foot. Um, on a pitched roof and six pounds per square foot on a flat roof. Uh, but I think it's important that any builder is going to speak to their PV consultant just to make sure that their engineer is going to approve that because uh, ultimately that's what's going to be needed for the permit application. So we've been doing five pounds for years. So, you know, similar range to what Will's talking about. One thing to consider though is whether your uh, municipality is going to require uh, use of scabs or whether you can direct drill into the top of the truss. Uh, that will depend on engineering as well. Some engineers frown upon it and they, they say you should really be using a, a parallel scab to, to um, seal into your, uh, your trusses, uh, into your trusses or fasten to your trusses, sorry. Uh, one of the arrow barrier questions that came up was when was the best time to do arrow barrier in new construction? Uh, we've, we've kind of goofed around on this. We've even actually done it, uh, right after framing before we even started insulating and that, that actually worked. It was kind of a little bit more product than we needed, but I found really that our sequencing wise is between, uh, drywall board and drywall mud seems to work fairly well because typically in a, in a production setting, your borders and your mudders are different guys. So your borders finish, you spray, and then you mud, and it seems to work pretty good. A question on uh, drain water. So on a two-story slab on grade house with showers on both levels, uh, do you recommend a horizontal heat reco uh, recovery drain pipe or, or uh, oh. uh, 
Green water. Don't work. Has to be within 5%. So that's a no. Okay. You're gonna you're uh, gonna extend your pipe until you can get into a common stock and then you gotta put it into the stock. Okay, so so horizontal does not work. It needs to be vertical or just slightly off vertical. Okay. So it works um, by centrifugal force, right? So the water goes down and it pushes out to the outside, and that's what exchanges the energy. If it's on if it's on a horizontal, the water flows on the bottom side. You don't get the same effect. It doesn't work. So question for Will: Are inverters generally located indoors or also outdoors? Uh, generally indoors. Uh, they are rated for outdoor. They're three R. Um, 3R rated and weatherproof. Uh, they're rated down to minus 40C. However, we prefer to put them inside just for access and maintenance if necessary. And uh, I think it's probably better for the power electronics over the long term to be inside. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any recommended Canadian PV panel system um, companies that you, you find uh, are good? Anybody you recommend? Canadian? In terms of module manufacturers, um, there are still a couple in in Canada. I mean, Canadian solar still manufacturing some modules in Guelph. Most of the manufacturing has left um, after the the feed-in tariff program ended because we no longer required the Canadian or the Ontario content. Um, inverter manufacturers are all located outside of Canada, so there's a couple of PV. Uh, manufacturers, Celestica, Canadian Solar. Other than that, I think they've all moved on as well. Just dying the time here, Steph. Let's go yep. one more and then uh, we'll do the rest by uh, email. Okay, I'll, I'll send out an easy one here. Uh, minimum pitch for south-facing solar. Minimum pitch, uh, zero degrees. <laughs> so that would be on a, you know, horizontal on a flat roof. Um, ideal pitch is, is a 912. Um, but, you know, anything facing south is going to do okay. Um, probably the minimum pitch, if you really want to maximize your generation over the course of the year, is going to be 5 or 10 degrees, uh, but you can go right to horizontal. Okay. Yeah. So we still have a few outstanding questions. What we'll do is we'll gather those answers uh, for you and send them out Um uh, next week. But in the meantime, I will have a resource email for you, um, hopefully by the end of today or, or tomorrow. All right. So are we ready to wrap things up, Doug? Yes, please. Thank you, everybody, for attending. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with everyone today. It was uh, fun, again, to do it. Absolutely. It was a lot of fun. Thank you so much, Doug and Will, for joining us. And of course, a big thank you to Enbridge uh, for their support and sponsorship of this program and this webinar series. And just as a reminder, I'll send in the resource email, I'll send uh, to you, you, you do need to uh, register for November 17th and November 24th. And uh, also, uh, when you have your email address uh, to me through the registration, we will uh, put you on a list uh, for information regarding the book uh, that's coming out. Once I end this session, you will receive a SurveyMonkey link. If you wouldn't mind just providing your feedback uh, for us, that would be great. So thank you so much, everyone. And I hope you have a great uh, few days until we see you on the 17th. Cheers. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.